Welcome back to week three, where we are going to be continuing our talk through the story of Israel. Now, we have just completed the conversation of the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. With the transition into the next book, we also make the transition into the next man. Recap, we have Moses, who is Hebrew, he's a Hebrew. His parents realize that while the Hebrew boys are being killed, that they can spare him by, instead of throwing him in the river and drowning, which was how most of them died, uh, they put him in a, a wicker basket and it floated down the river, Pharaoh's daughter, claims her, claims him, and then raises him as an Egyptian. So he's part Hebrew and part Egyptian. And then he grows up to be very educated in Egyptian ways, but in touch with his Hebraic ways. And about the age 40, he sees a Egyptian hurting a Hebrew, and he takes the life of the Egyptian and out of fear flees. And he is shepherding for 40 years. And in the midst of that time, he's learning wilderness, he's learning the area, and this is foreshadowing of something great to come. And 40 years after that, that murder that he committed, uh, God appears to him in a bush that is a fire but not consumed. He speaks to him and says, you need to go to Pharaoh and tell him to let my people go. Moses, now 80, goes and does this. Pharaoh's heart is hardened by God. His heart is hardened and he will not let the people go. And so there are plagues. The final plague is the death of the firstborn. At the death of the firstborn, there's blood put over the door frames of the houses of the Jews, and therefore death passes over those homes. And so just as Moses was spared as a baby, now all these other babies are spared, male and female. Uh, the firstborn were the ones to go. And this starts the beginning of the great Passover. Egyptians, under the inspiration of God, give them silver and gold and great possessions, and then they leave, and they cross over the Red or the Reed Sea, and they go in out of North Africa up towards what we would call the Middle East, and they have an opportunity to go into land, but the spies come in, 10 of the 12 come back and say, no way, we're too small, they're too big. Yes, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. Yes, it's a wonderful land, but we're not ready to go in. And so Caleb and Joshua are the only ones who will go in because every man 20 years or older will pass away, and Moses himself does not go in for multiple reasons, but the main one, as we saw, is that when asked to speak, or commanded to speak to a rock and thus give water to the people, out of anger, he struck the rock, and speaking of himself and of Aaron, he said, should we bring you water versus should God bring you water? Now, God went ahead and blessed that action in the sense of giving water to the million and a half, two million people, but Moses was no longer allowed to go in. And so a man fills his shoes, and that man's name is Joshua. He is one of the two spies that confirmed that God was going to be with them. Uh, Caleb, given the spokesman's job there, it says that he is going to lead us to victory. Uh, Joshua's uh, not spoken, uh, has not spoken there, but we do know from the context that he would have been involved in that positive report because Moses hears from God that that Caleb son of Jephuna and Joseph son of Nun will go in so he was involved in that and for various reasons ultimately the sovereign of God and his choice Joshua is called into that commitment now one of the things that makes Joshua unique is his name uh, you will see that that J Joshua the the Yah the the Joshua would have the Yah as in Yahweh. And so his name actually means the Lord saves or Yahweh saves. You would say Yeshua, Joshua, Yeshua, for those who are in, in familiar with the name of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, that is a name that is derived from the Hebrew word Yeshua. So Joshua is a foreshadowing of Jesus because just as Jesus is the great Savior, God is salvation. This Joshua is salvation. Now, Moses did a great job, but he didn't finish the job. Jo Joshua is the one who's going to bring them in. 
So the man, Joshua, is that first blank. And the thing to know about him, he's, he's born in Egypt. He's the only one minus Caleb and women and children who will go into the land uh, that was not born. He's the only one that was born other uh, than those other select few I mentioned uh, to go into the promised land that was born in Egypt. Uh, his name, again, those blanks, Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. He was actually commissioned by Yahweh uh, to become Moses's follower and the one who fills his shoes. And Moses, respectfully, as we just saw in the last lecture, uh, gives that over, passes the torch, lets the people know that he's behind God's decision. So while Moses does not get to go into the land, he is one that is willing to hand over the torch and say, this is not mine. He didn't argue with God. He didn't try to somehow make Joshua ineligible. He actually invited this for the people after he knew he was no longer going to be a part of it. The, the next blanks are Joshua is the new Moses. We think of Joshua as the new Moses. What's interesting is you, you go later in the scriptures, particularly once you get to the New Testament, and Moses is mentioned way more than Joshua. And one of the reasons is that Joshua, although a new man, is in many ways known as the new Moses, as the one who's going to fulfill what Moses, Moses should have done. But Joshua is the man for the job. Some things that bring them similarities. Uh, one is that Joshua assumes the military leadership once Moses is no longer a part of it and therefore completes the work of Moses. Uh, another thing we see is that Joshua leads the people across a great body of water, this time the Jordan River, whereas Moses led them across the Red, or in the Hebrew, the Reed Sea. Now Joshua leads the people across a body of water. You see Joshua's leadership in that. We also see that he removes his shoes in the presence of the Lord. We find that in chapter 5, verse 15, Joshua Chapter 5, verse 15 says, Now, when Jer Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell face down on the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have from his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So what we see here is a reflection back to Moses taking his shoes off in the holy ground in the, at the bush. And here we have this victory uh, that's coming in Jericho and he's taking the shoes off. Recognition that to be in the presence of a holy God is a severe thing, a beautiful and wonderful thing but one not to be taken lightly. We also see that he intercedes for the nation. There are times when the, the story is told, at least the narrative is told that it's, it's God losing his temper with the people and he's about to wipe them out. And Moses steps in and says, please have love on the people. But theologically speaking, most likely when we look at that text, what's happening there is it's God testing Moses. Are you going to want me to destroy the people or are you going to simply throw in the towel and say, okay, wipe them out. I'm with you, God. And Moses stands up and intercedes for the people. And Joshua does the same thing by interceding for the people. He also leads the nation in the observance of the Passover, which is huge. Uh, keep in mind that Moses and Joshua, unlike other leaders later on, political leaders, they are, they are prophets and priests. They are leaders and religious leaders, military leaders and religious leaders. Uh, so they do lead in the Passover. And both made provisions for the allotment of land. They worked with the people and described what land they would get. And also there is, there is circumcision um, that takes place under Joshua and carries on, carries on that tradition. So those are some things we can know about the man, Joshua. Now we're going to talk about the book of Joshua. So next blank, book of Joshua. It picks up right where Deuteronomy left off. Thus, that's where we find it in the canon of the Old Testament. Uh, at the time, the Israelites were encamped on the plains of Moab, and they're waiting for the Lord's command to go over into Canaan. We're going to find five major theological motifs or themes in the book of Joshua. And each of the next blanks 
are one of those five motifs or themes. By this we mean that as you read throughout the book of Joshua, all the chapters, you're going to see a mention of one or the two throughout all through the books. You're going to have five motifs, five key themes that Joshua is, the book of Joshua is articulating. Now keep in mind, as we said, uh, the Bible tells us some world history, Genesis 1 through 11. And then in Genesis 12, it narrows down to the family of Abram. And it's not only narrowed down to family, but narrowing down events. So there's other things going on that we're not told about because it's not primarily interesting or specific to the ta to the task at hand, telling the redemption story, God's redemptive story for his people. So when we think about this book, there are other things that are left out. So the book wants to, in great detail, talk about many things, but also leave out details so it can focus on five themes. The first theme is that of holy war. Holy war. This is a, this is a theme that has kind of been on the front page for uh, many, many years, particularly in our country, uh, particularly after the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, the argument began to say, is this a justified war? Is this a war that we should be fighting? And you, you probably heard some of those words, either if you're alive then or if you're a little bit younger and you've heard reports of that. And we, we see that nations, including our own, struggle with, is this a legitimate war? Is this something that we should do? What you're going to find in Joshua is a lot of battle. And these battles are sanctioned by God. Now, some of the warfare they do steps out of those bounds and uh, they are penalized for this. But the ultimate idea that you're going to go into this land as promised to Abram, and you're going to have war. And so they're, they're holy war in nature. If you do a little more direct study on this, you're going to understand they don't just go in and take over the masses. They're, it's very strategic in their way, targeted warfare, if you will, which again is brutal, but is also guided and restricted by God. And that's what makes it holy. It's not just men getting upset with other men. It's men saying God has given us this land. Now, some of it raised the question. There are other people that have claimed that throughout history. We think of the, the Crusades. You think of land being taken from one na nation thinking that's their destiny. And there's all sorts of historical debates and historical harm in those. But what we find in the Old Testament is this valuable lesson that the people are now going into the land that was promised to Abram and what it took in order for that to happen in part was holy war. Another theme you see is the theme of land. We've been talking about that a lot, but Joshua is going to go into great detail about the land that the people are in. What you're going to find with that is not only the answer to promise Abram, but also a description of the land, a description of the land because God promised not just any land. He promised good land. We, we think about as they move forward out of North Africa and the, where Egypt is, we, we go in and you're going to see lush land around the Jordan River. And you're going to see this Mediterranean Sea, which is going to, in its time, uh, be very fruitful in, 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 uh, in having the access to fish and having ex access to travel and commerce and trade. And it is the connection between the African continent and the European and Asian continents as they all come together right there in the crux of that land. And so this is a very rich land and beautiful land. And this is why God wants to give it to his chosen people. Another motif, the third motif and third blank there and a number three is the unity of Israel. We've seen a slave people form into tribal people who are now traveling as one and what's going to happen as they go in is they're going to get pieces of land as they go. They're going to send their fighting men and some of the women and children will stay back and get the land developed until the warriors come back. And so all through this, you see more and more land being taken over and developed by the Jewish people. And what you're going to find, even though they're coming to different places for inhabiting, that they are also understanding that they are Israel as a people group. Think, think of times in our nation where we talk about all of us are American, regardless of creed and color and background and political persuasion and choices in life. We are American. One of the things that I think of is the Olympics. About every four years, uh, if you're watching uh, the Summer Olympics or the Winter Olympics, and an American is achieving their sport excellence. 
And even if we don't know, if we know nothing else about the person, we know they're American, we're rooting for them to win the gold. Now, if we met them personally, we may not even like them, but we see them as the American. It draws us together. Well, think about this as the Israelites saying, we are one people. We are joined together in this task. What you're going to find soon after the book of Joshua, as we get into Judges and as we move further along in uh, the stories of Samuel and the stories of all these others that are the kings are going to come later, there's going to be unity and discord, unity and discord. They'll be united and then they will split. And eventually under the kingship of Solomon, you see the trouble begin to arise, but then soon thereafter, there's great division ultimately where tribes will split never to come back together. But here is this unity of Israel. Even the term all Israel will be used. And then the fourth thing that we see is the role of Joshua. Um, it's going to unpack some, some of the things we unpacked earlier about how he's similar to Moses. And then again, this idea of covenant. Covenant. So the first blank, holy war, second land, the third unity of Israel, fourth role of Joshua, and fifth covenant. Joshua has been referred to, the book is, a literary bridge between Israel's wilderness experience and the narrative of going into the land. He, he is the link. He is the one that brings things together. You can kind of think of him, obviously, in a different context, but you think of John the baptizer in the Gospels, he's somewhat of a carryover from the Old Testament. Now, he himself wasn't, but he as a prophet of old who spoke much like the Old Testament prophets is, is leading the way, is laying the, the groundwork for Jesus to come. Joshua is the one who says, this is what Moses was doing. And I was there to witness this. And now I'm helping us go into the next phase for our people. He is, he is the transition piece. And there are two main parts of this book. So if you look at the book as a whole, and you, you have to look at the chapters as you divide them out before the book of Judges, you're going to see that in the, in the 24 chapters that they are divided roughly into two main categories, and then we'll divide them down into three smaller categories. But overall speaking, when you first read Joshua, the book, you're going to see that it's about a rapid survey of the conquest of the land. So they look at the land, they survey it, and then they have conquest, they have victory. That's the first part of the book. The second part of the book describes how the land was divided very specifically among the 12 tribes. So they go in, they look at the land, they take it over, part one. Part two, now that we've won the land, here's how we divide it, here's how we make sure it's fair, here's how we make sure everybody gets the land they need, which is going to include where the Levites fit in, Levites fit in, and how tra half tribe of Manasseh is going to stay on the other side of the River Jordan because that's where they feel comfortable. Those are in the old land, but still part of the unity of Israel. Uh, but the two main themes, the scene and the capturing of land and then the developing of land. Now to outline the chapters, we can say that chapters one through 12 of Joshua are about the military conquest. Chapters 13 through 22 are about the fulfillment of the people, the stability of the people on that land. And then verse 23 and or chapters 23 and 24 are the renewal of Israel's old covenant with God. That they are now more closely connected to the original covenant to Abraham by the end of the book. That there is beauty in this journey, that there's been struggle and chaos and uh, people that are outside of the will of God, but now they're back inside the will of God. Uh, there's, there's deeply embedded in almost every part of the Bible, this, te this tension between God's holiness and his graciousness. And we're going to find this in this text, particularly the carryover from Moses, the punishment on the people, but the grace upon the people. And you're going to see this throughout. Now, when they go, one of the first things that they encounter is the city of Jericho. Now, as you study the book of Jericho or the, the story of Jericho, you will understand that this is unlikely warfare. There's more instruments than, and then weapon. The, the swords, the other weapons will come out after the battle is already won basically by the instruments, the trumpets, the marching around of obedience, the, what would look foolish to the people on the inside of the wall, on the outside, it's the true blessing of God 
as they walked around the walls of, of Jericho. There is a result of their disobedience. Along the way, they don't conquer as much. And so there is going to be a type of land that is not fully devoted to God. And that's going to come back to haunt them, if you will. That's something to keep an eye on. Um, as far as the authorship and the date, one of the things it says in the text is the words, to this day. It's written as if unto this day. It clearly suggests there's a time later. Therefore, it seems that the, the work consists of work, workings and writings during the time of Joshua, but there was one who compiled those works together. So we don't get this image that Joshua, this great warrior, was sitting down with pen and paper, but that someone else later was collecting those stories, much like some of the books of Moses were not written by Moses himself, but about Moses and about the workings of Moses. Uh, the invasion in Canaan took place around 1400, and the date of Exodus was approximately 1446. And so those are the events, historical events, but would not have been written till a little bit later. So let's talk more about the promised land itself. The promised land itself. You are familiar with the, the tension in modern day between the Palestinians and the Jewish people. Rewinding history a bit, back in 1947, at the end, at the end of World War II, uh, there was a gathering of the Western leaders of the allies, and they came together and said, what's happened to the Jews during the World War II events under Hitler and this great decimation of their people that we want to recognize that they need a safe place to be, to, to connect. And prior to this, a lot of Russian Jews had migrated into that area. And so they, they created a state of Israel within the country of Palestine. So when we're talking about the Holy Land, we're talking about the modern day country of Palestine, the state of Israel and the surrounding areas, um, Syria and Northwest of, of, of Jerusalem and Israel, in Palestine. And so what we find is there's still dispute over land, but the land of Palestine was the area they're heading. So again, if you can, if you can picture where Europe and Asia meet and then you can picture North Africa, right between the two is this strip of land on the east side of the Mediterranean Sea. And that's where we are talking about. Now you have good maps in your, in your Bible. It's your textbook, other Bibles as well online. You can check this out. But I'll read you a couple paragraphs here from the Learning Bible, one of the older textbooks from this course before they updated. It says, Palestine refers to the area of land along the east coast of the Mediterranean Sea, from Gaza in the south to southern Lebanon, then east to the area bordering the Jordan River. It was also known as the land of Canaan or the Holy Land. In the Bible, it's known as a land flowing with milk and honey, or as the promised land, because God promised to give the land to Abraham and his descendants. The region of Palestine was originally called Canaan, and the people who lived there before the Israelites were called Canaanites. It came to be known as Israel after the 12 tribes conquered the land. The region came to be known as Palestine in the time when the Greeks ruled the region, beginning in about 333 BC. The name Palestine comes from Philistines, the name of the people who settled in the narrow strip of land along the southwestern part of the Mediterranean coastline sometime after 1200 BC. Today, Palestine refers to the area covered by Israel, Gaza, and the Jordan. You will find it interesting to stay in touch with modern media as it reflects upon these very areas of land that we are talking about. The promised land equals Palestine. You can write that down in your notes. The, the book of Joshua has an idealized picture, an idealized picture. What that means is it's not giving us the whole story. It's not being dishonest. It's just not telling the whole story. It's, it's telling, in some ways, the good side of the story. You think of telling um, your family a good story from your life and you might leave out parts that are less than stellar or parts that don't matter as much well there's a little bit of this in here not to hide things but to to make the story great and what we mean by this is they didn't actually take the whole land 
God gives them land, and it's, but it's not because God didn't give it. They didn't take it all. They simply um, took lots of it, but not all of it. The, there are people that have varying views of this exodus, and, and some would call it a migration simply that turned into war. Some would call it a, a peasant revolt. Regardless, it's a directed action by God telling people you need to expand into a land so that your people can expand and so that you can go into the land that was promised to Abraham. So how total was the victory? Well, the book itself notes that there remained yet very much land to be possessed. Uh, in chapter 13, we find some details to this matter. Chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. It says, then when Joshua had grown old, the Lord said to him, you are now very old and there are still very large areas of land to be taken. And then it lists those. And then jumping down to verse six, it says, as for all the inhabitants of the mountain regions from Lebanon to Misrephoth, Maim, that is all the Sidonians, I myself will drive them out before the Israelites. Be sure to allocate this land to Israel for an inheritance as I instructed you. And divide it as inheritance among the nine tribes and half of the tribe of Manasseh. So we have this clear articulation in text that up until then you might think all the land is taken. Because in chapter 12 it's talking about the defeated kings, which is quite a long list. And then they are saying, well, there's a lot of land not taken. Some of that is dis disobedience. Some of that is strategy. But we do know that. The book is honest because in verse 13, as the word of God, always honest, saying there is some land not taken. There is a key point in this story, and I want to spend some time on that. And this goes back to Joshua chapter two. Now, this is among the first around that first major conquest on Jericho. Now, before I do that, I want us to think about a story in the New Testament. It's actually a genealogy. And in Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament, there is a genealogy of Jesus. Uh, this person also, also mentioned in uh, the by faith statements in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews, a New Testament book presenting the gospel to Jewish people. Um, in Matthew chapter one, you find an interesting mention. In chapter 1, verse 5, in listing all these folks, it says, Salom, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz is going to marry Ruth, and they are going to have, uh, they're going to have Obed. Obed's going to have Jesse, and Jeff is, Jeff is, Jesse's going to have King David. So very strong family line that leads all the way from Abraham to Jesus. Boaz is a key character in there. And Ruth is a great character in there. But in order for Boaz to be there, you have to see Rahab. Now, the Bible calls Rahab a, a Moabite, meaning she's not Jewish. So how does she come into play? Well, when the Israelite people go into Jericho, they send spies. I've done this spy thing before. It didn't turn out right. But this did. And they go in into a woman's home. And people were often going to this home because it was the home of a prostitute. And the Israelites were not using that experience in order to partake in, in any kind of sexual activity. They were going in there because that was uh, one of two things. One, they were just using the place because uh, that was a well-traveled area, uh, often frequent in place. Or sometimes, according to history, you have what we would call brothels that also had guest rooms for just normal guest room, take a nap and stay a while. We're not exactly sure, but we do know that Rahab is the, the prostitute who welcomes these individuals and hides them out so that the Jericho soldiers cannot take their lives. She, ha she has them promise, if I protect you, when you come back, I know your Lord is going to give you victory, but would you save my family? And her life is spared because of her faithfulness. And so you have a Moabite woman a Moabitess, who comes in to the Israelite story. So one thing you see, as much as the story up until 
even the time of Acts, New Testament is a Jewish story from basically Genesis 12 to Acts 1. It's a Jewish story with Christ being a Jew himself who is going to begin what will become known as Christianity. There's this Jewish story, but in the midst of this Jewish story, you see these beautiful moments of Gentile or non-Jewish people rising into the occasion. They're coming to be a part of the story. You, you think of Rahab, you think of uh, Ruth, you think of people who have come in and made a part of this journey by stepping into Jewish faith, stepping into Jewish history. And it's such a beautiful environment for the people to experience when they enter into this Jewish community, they realize that God is with these people. And so you have Rahab and it says here at the beginning of chapter two, Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there. And from there, the story begins. Now, I said a minute ago about uh, the non-Jew misspoke there with her being a Moabitess. That's Ruth. But regardless, you have a person from Jericho and a person of Moabite history and heritage who come together and truly are part of that story. One of the things we want to unpack now a little bit more are the ideas of what's going on in the book that show this, this is God's story. Remember when we're studying the Bible, people are obviously part of the story, but it's really about God and his plan for his people. And ultimately for all people. In the book of Joshua, Showing this, you, you see God's actions that we would call miracles. That's a word that is used in many ways. Sometimes it's used in the way of people saying, I simply don't believe in them. They say rather it's a consequence or something we just cannot explain. Other people use it too freely and say it's a miracle when they don't test it. They don't see if it actually was a miracle. Maybe it was a medical healing. Maybe it was something to it. Other people We'll use it in a way that is too loose in the sense of it's a miracle that I found my wallet. Well, that's not a miracle. It's a good thing. But when the Bible is talking about a miracle, it's talking about something that cannot be explained naturally. It, it happens to be supernatural. It happens through supernatural means, meaning that this could not have happened without the hand of God. Any true miracle happens by the hand of God and cannot happen without it. So there are things that are bizarre. There are things that are mysterious or things that are unknown by us at this time. Those are not necessarily miracles. What miracles are is God's hand supernaturally working within the natural. Now, that's not really a surprise to people who believe in God because he is the creator. And therefore, he can do as he pleases, as he works with his creation and steps in and uses the miraculous to accomplish purposes. Ultimate miracle as Christians believe, is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We see the same Jesus calming the waters of the Mediterranean Sea, and people are saying, who is this that even has control of the waves and the wind? You see the raising of Lazarus. You see the people of the Old Testament who are receiving the water from Moses and the manna, as we've, as we've already studied. Uh, we see the, the widow of Elijah, who, with Elijah, who uh, gives of her, her final batch of food, but then it miraculously saved and fed we see miracle after miracle after miracle, the Red Sea, the plagues, all of this. But in the book of Joshua, I want to highlight these three miracles, and then we're going to move on to talk about some subjects further that we've already delved, delved into. First one is the idea of the Jordan. Uh, that is a miracle. Uh, the water is parted just as the reed or Red Sea was and introduces that this is a miraculous book. Second miracle you see is that of Jericho. I described that victory a little bit ago, but it's a week-long victory. Uh, and the first six days, at least from a military standpoint, it seems like nothing happens. For six days, God tells them to simply get up in the morning and blow the trumpets and march around the city one time. And they do this for six days. And the seventh day, they to get up and do the same thing and go around seven times. And as the trumpets are blown after the seventh time, the walls of Jericho fall down. So then what we would know as regular military tactics from that day, 
they rush in and they take the lives of those that were not taken in the fall of the walls. So there's a miracle there. It's very precise. It's very specific. And that is one thing that happens. Another thing is this idea of the, the sun standing still. What does this look like? Well, the, Joshua needed a battle and needed more light. And so God allowed the sun to stand still. Uh, there is a survey, uh, Old Testament survey uh, book that uh, addresses some of this. And we want to talk about this a little bit because scientists wonder what happens because we think of the sun standing still. Well, we know, scientifically speaking, that would have meant actually that the earth stood still, uh, which because uh, the sun doesn't move. And it, it makes an interesting uh, conversation of what actually happened because scientists tell us that the earth stopped spinning, uh, then uh, basically very soon thereafter, there's there's death because of gravitational pull and everything's thrown off and the sun doesn't move. So what do you do, what do you to do with it? So let me give you some uh, thoughts from other scholars. So some believe that Joshua was asking for relief from the sun's heat. Others that the rays of the sun and the moon were bent by an alteration of the refracting power of the atmosphere. So the sun and moon appeared to stand still. Whatever happened and something must have occurred. The faith of the Israelites was greatly strengthened by it. So what are they talking about? Well, in Joshua chapter 10, um, we find in verse 12, this mention. Now to give you some extra work to do, which won't be much, but if you have the actual textbook, you can go to page 378 and 379. If you do not have the textbook and you have the electronic version, find that in the, in the back at the end rather, um, which is, Titled, The Sun Stands Still and the Moon Stops. That's the title of the article you need to read. But, but to give you an idea of what's going on there, in, uh, in chapter 10, you have this, this victory that comes in a battle, but it comes at a request um, for the people uh, to have victory. And beginning in verse 6, it says the Gibeonites then sent word to Joshua in the camp, camp of Gilgal, do not abandon your servants. Come up to us quickly and save us. Help us because all the Amorite kings from the hill country have joined forces against us. So Joshua marched up from the Gilgal with his entire army, including all the best fighting men. The Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them. I have given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. After an all night march from Gilgal, Joshua took them by surprise. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road, going up to Beth Haran and cut down all the way to Ezra and Makeda. As they fled before Israel on the road down from Beth Haran to Ezra, uh, Azekah, the Lord hurled large hailstones down on them and more of them died from the hail than were killed by the swords of the Israelites. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua and the Lord in the presence of the end of said in the presence of the Lord, sun stand still over Gibeon and you moon over the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. It is written in the book of Jashar. The sun stopped in the middle of the sky and delayed going down till for about a full day. There has never been a day like it before or since, a day when the Lord listened to a human being. Sure, the Lord was fighting for Israel. And Joshua returned with all the Israelites to the camp of Gilgal. The Alaskans might know best of anyone about the long days of sun, but this was a miraculous day. We don't know exactly how that happened. Most likely there is a way in which God made that happen, uh, obviously without the sun moving and without the the, the or stop in rotation, but it looked to them as if the sun stood still. And don't let that throw you if you believe in the truthful of scripture, truthfulness of scripture, which which I do. But we also know that there are images of the ends of the earth in the Old Testament, for example. And there are no ends to the earth, literally. We know that we live on a globe, not a flat land. And so to think of things as being described as the people knew them makes sense because if they would have talked about a globe versus the ends of the earth, people would not have understood that. And you talk about the idea of a sun standing still and the planets rotating and trying to figure all this out to these people that time. Well, that, that 
day of science exploration and would not quite have understood that. And that's OK. It's still true. It's in language they would have understood. So did Joshua make the sun stand still? Uh, other scholars say that the passage in the question is poetry or at least contains a few lines of poetry. In poetry, literal meanings often replaced by figures of speech. And the verb translated be still in English can mean remain motionless or be quiet. So there's this idea that God controls it in his unique way. Another thing we can think about is hail. This reminds us of the plagues, the frogs, the blood, the locusts, etc., that these things were not unheard of, uh, especially locusts and frogs. Neither, neither was hail not heard of, but the, the specific time and breadth of it, it was what makes it a miracle. Another thing we see in the next blank is this idea. This is now past miracles. We're talking about covenant. That's the next blank, covenant renewal. Now, Mount Ebal, as opposed to Mount Sinai, where Moses had the covenant renewal, now we have the covenant renewal for under Joshua on another mountain, which is Mount Ebal, E-B-A-L, this new covenant renewal. So not only is Joshua filling the shoes of Moses, not only is Joshua going across a body of water, not only is Joshua leading tribes, but Joshua is also going to go up and reestablish the covenant or the law. Well, I'd like to spend a little time on this idea of the Holy War and go back and talk about that a little bit more. One of the biggest questions people have with those of non-Christian faith and Christian faith is what about all the violence in the Old Testament, as I mentioned a little while ago? What do we do with all this violence? We, we talk about, Christians do, the, the love of God, and that we quote Old Testament and New, where it talks about the God is love and the, the beautiful nature of God and that God cares, he creates, he sustains, he loves he is forgiving. He cast our sins from as far as the east is from the west. All these beautiful images of love. And so a lot of us are scratching our heads at times as we're reading about the annihilation of peoples, including children in some of the passages. And we hear the violent language um, spoken by both men and women. Miriam, for example, the sister of Moses, sings a very violent song of celebration uh, for the victory over Pharaoh and his armies. And we ask ourselves, what does this look like? How do we wrap that around this idea of a loving God? Well, to give you a backstory again, remember that God is all loving and God is all wise at the same time. And our knowledge is limited. So we have to first remember that before we go any further. But what does it look like? Well, first of all, I want to talk to you about the morals and ethics of God dealing with the whole holy war. I mentioned some of this before, but let's be more specific. So the blank after covenant renewal is holy. So holy war, question mark. Is it really holy? It is war. We know that. But is it holy? Well, let's think about the rules. Number one, God can do whatever he wants is what some people say. In other words, he's guiding do whatever he wants. There is some truth to that. It's not all true. And by this we mean, yes, God is all powerful. But God cannot do something contrary to his character. There's the old little saying that, tries to trick people and say, is God so powerful if he can do everything? Can he create a rock too heavy for him to pick up? That's nonsensical. We're saying, is God able to do something that is against his character? So can God do everything? Yes, but God can't do everything in the sense of he can't do something that's against his character, meaning his character is love. So he has to do things with love. So to simply say, as we read these difficult passages, to say God can do whatever he wants is not accurate theology. Another way to look at it uh, is a second option people have is that events happened. Then people went back and attributed them to God. I went to a visit a church over a Christmas service several years ago, and this was the view of the pastor there, that it was a human perspective. They went back and, and made it a faith war, even though it was a regular war. That, that's a comfortable thing to say, but the problem with that, it devalues the authenticity of scripture, which we believe is true. And if, it's written and God says, this is what happens. Then it's not retroactively going back and saying, well, this isn't what happened, but we're going to say this happened. So the first option is not a good one. The second option is a good one. The third is some say it's, it's a 
total creation. It's a it's a fabrication. In other words, it's a, a way that we we say this sounds good to make a story. So think of the American stories we make up about George Washington chopping down the tree and he can't lie. And some of these other stories that aren't accurate at all, but they sound good. Some people say that's what we've done with the Bible. But again, that dis discounts biblical authority. The fourth one is God's accommodation. Uh, this is a theory that's it's getting close. This is the one that says, well, this is not, this is not beautiful. This is not first design, but I'm going to use this in order to accomplish my purposes. So let me give you some other examples in scripture where that kind of thing does happen. I mentioned that in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, you have this beautiful creation and you have Adam and Eve and the they leave their father and mother and unite as one. Now, they don't leave father and mother because they didn't have one, but that was a precursor to what couples were to do, to leave father and mother and become one. And we see that it's Adam and it's Eve. And we have to go in a couple more chapters. We see sin in chapter three. And then very, chapter four, we start seeing this arising a polygamy. It's married of more than one person. Now, you read through the Old Testament, you see more and more polygamy and nearly every famous person of faith, once you get several pages into the law of Moses is a person who is married to more than one person. What are we to do that? Do with that? Well, clearly not God's plan. Thankfully, by the time you get the new Testament, uh, there is only monogamy there. Anybody outside of that is viewed as not living by God's command. So what's going on there? It's God's accommodation. God says, King David is going to be a good king. And so, yes, he, he has other wives. And that's not my plan, but I'm not going to put an end to it at this point. That is coming. So there's accommodation. But those four options, with the fourth being closed, still leave us asking the question, what can God do and why would he do what he did? So the next question, can God ask to kill? Well, the Canaanites were descendants of the Amorites. Let's remember who those were. We go back to Genesis 15. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, we see these words. Going back to verse 12. As we talk about Abram, we're in this context where he is uh, already been promised this beautiful victory. And God makes a covenant uh, with Abraham in the midst of it. He says, as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain that for 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and that they'll be enslaved and mistreated there. So tell him ahead of time, way ahead of time of the Egyptian captivity. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. So the sin of the Amorites, we're going to get to that here in just a second. It says, when the sun had set, the darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. To your descendants, I give this land. From the wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Kadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hephites, Amorites, Canaanites, etc. So we have this wonderful promise of God that tells of things before they happen. Now go back to verse 16, and it says the sin of the Amorites. And we're going to see a mention in 1 Kings chapter 21, which comes later, but we're going to see a reference because this is um, something that is articulated in Scripture. Uh, 1 Kings 21, verse 26. It says, he behaved in the vilest manner by 
by going after idols like the Amorites the Lord drove out before Israel. So every time you see this, this Amorite image, this idea of this enemy of God, not just enemies of the people. The idea that there's such something so corrupt about these people that they had to be dealt with in this way. Now, the Amorites were given 400 years to repent is another thing to keep in mind. Um, and also, it's more of a judgment than an on-right, outright slaughter. The idea in Joshua 24 is there's no tolerance for other deities is another aspect of this. Israelites captured Jericho. They burned the city, including the inhabitants. They did the same in Ai and elsewhere. The word for destruction is harem, meaning devotion to utterly destroy. The suggestion that God could command anyone to kill another or that he should command the complete extermination of every living being in the city is so offensive to many that they, they think that maybe the God of the Old Testament is not the God of the New. And you hear this a lot even within churches. It's a common practice for people to devote themselves in this idea of this captivity uh, or these being captive to God no matter what he wants to do. Uh, but then also someone will be repelled by that and say, I can't follow this God. One thing to keep in mind is that God's revelation is progressive. He takes his people, as the scholar says, where they are and leads them step by step until at last they're with where he is. At this point, the Israelites were not ready for such teachings in the Sermon on the Mount, like love your enemies. If they had been, God would have given them such revelations. In Yahweh's eyes, the Canaanites were exceedingly great sinners who not only committed abominations, but also sought to entice Israel to join them in their religious act. So keep in mind that the purity of the people, the uniqueness of the people, the circumcision actually and figuratively of the people was important because they were to stand apart. They were to be a different people. And if they allowed the corruption in, they were going to falter from where they should be as a people. Another explanation uh, that people have as far as if you're still struggling with this is this answer that there is an ultimate destiny according to Christian theology of people who follow God through Jesus in heaven and those who not spend eternity in hell. And this is the Christian doctrine of the afterlife. And the idea here is God would know that those people would not repent. And so if he knew they're not going to repent, their destination is already hell, not heaven. And so they would have already gone there, whether the Israelites defeated them or if they're defeated in another way. You don't find that exact answer in scripture, but I'm giving you some theories that people use to try to deal with this. Bottom line, biblically speaking, if we respect the Bible as authority of God, the God of Genesis and the God of Revelation, the God of the old and the God of the new, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit are consistent throughout. And there are times when God is using love through the sense of care and touch and others where love is corrective. And other times when God says, these are my people. And in order to accomplish my plan for my people, people who are against my people are suffering in that process. And God is sovereign. We're not going to get all our answers and all the questions to our answers, all our answers to the questions, but we're going to be able to, uh, to see that there's a unified story here. Again, the redemptive story that God is playing out for his people. A couple of last things before we close out today's lecture is the remainder notes, remainder on your notes. And that is the first blank that we'll cover is the achievement of rest. So the blank is rest, the achievement of rest. This is the rest for God's people and within this rest for God's people, there's this rich blessing and this future. And anytime there is rest in the land and rest in the people, it means that theologically speaking, they're living for God as they should. Unfortunately, it doesn't last very long normally, uh, but there's great rest for the people. Uh, chapter 24, verse 28 through 33, gives us an illustration of this type of rest. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each their own inheritance. So they said, this is your, this is your land. This is your land. Reubenites go here. Uh, 
the Ephraimites go here, those from Manasseh go here, Joshua go, etc. It says, Joshua dismissed the people each to their own inheritance. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, a servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land of his inheritance in Timnath Sarah, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaosh. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua, to his faithfulness. And the elders who outlived him and who experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua's bones, which Israelites, and Joseph's bones, which the Israelites had brought up to Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. Notice what happens throughout the life of Joshua. The people are devoted and there's rest and there's peace and good is happening for them. This is beauty. And it's during this time you have the rich establishment again of the Passover and the beautiful restoration of the people just mentally and emotionally and spiritually. And it's a healthy time for Israel. We want to back up just a couple of chapters as we close out and we look at this in the last blink, J Joshua's last words. What are the last things he said, which normally we say when a person speaks their last words, that there's something meaningful and beautiful about them. Well, back in chapter 22, it says, Then Joshua summoned the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh, and he said to them, You have done all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded, and you have obeyed me in everything I commanded. For a long time now, to this very day, there's that phrase we mentioned earlier, you have not deserted your fellow Israelites, but have carried out the mission the Lord your God gave you. Now the Lord your God has given you the rest and given them rest as the as he promised. Return to your homes in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of the Jordan. But be very careful to keep the commandments and the law that Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commands, to hold fast to him, and to serve him with all their heart and with all their soul. So these are the people that are going to be furthest away. I mentioned earlier, the wives and children would stay back on land, and the soldiers would come and help their brothers defeat their land, and now they can go back. And so Joshua is sending them off, so the last words to those people before they go back. And then in chapter 23, we see his final words to the group's that are still there. So back in 22, verse 34, it says, And the Rubite, Reubenites and the Gadites gave the altar his name, a witness between us, and the Lord is God. Uh, and then we move on. After a long time had passed, and the Lord had given Israel rest from all their enemies around them, Joshua, by then a very old man, summoned all Israel, their elders, leaders, judges, and officials, and said to them, I am very old. You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. Remember now how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the land of the nations that remain, the nations I conquered, between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The Lord your God himself will punish them, push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you, and you will take possession of the land as the Lord your God promised you. Be very strong. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of law of Moses without turning aside to the right or the left. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke, invoke the names of their God or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them, but you are to hold fast to the, to the Lord your God as you have until now. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations that remain among you, and if you intermarry with them and associate with them, then you may be sure that the Lord your God will no longer drive out these nations before you. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your backs and thorns in your eyes until you perish from this good land which the Lord your God is, has given you. Now, I'm about to go the way of the earth. You know all, with all your heart and soul, that you that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you 
has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as all the good things the Lord your God has promised you have come to you, so he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land he has given you. If you violate the covenant, Lord your God, which he commanded you, and go and serve other gods and bow down to them, the Lord's anger will burn against you, and you'll be quickly, you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. Very, very powerful words. Words of choice. Back to this covenant idea. God's keeping his covenant, and you have a choice. He's saying to them, stay this course, stay faithful, love the Lord, and this will go well with you. If you do not, here is what's going to happen. You heard me talk about a few classes ago about the idea of the way in which we have this covenant that is given by God and we choose to accept it or not accept it. And this prophetic image, prophecy, You'll remember me talking about forth telling and foretelling and foretelling. If this were foretelling, Joshua would be saying, this is what's going to happen because this is a choice you're going to make. In other words, he just knows what's going to happen. Forth telling is what this kind of prophecy is, where he's saying, if you choose this, this is going to happen. If you choose faithfulness, things will go well with you. And if you choose this, this will go well with you. If you choose disobedience, then this will go. This is how things will go for you. And so you see a large portion of this writing here at the end of Joshua is that being of forth telling. And as we continue to read, we're going to see the results of their choices. I will see you on the next lecture.